Hello and uh, you know, a very warm welcome to you all. Um, thank you for joining today's uh, breakfast briefing session on uh, minimising your inside uh, threat risk. Uh, we're recording today's session as well, so we'll make the recording available to you all later on. Uh, but first, some introductions. My name's Richard Enderby. I head up the cybersecurity practice for CDW within the UK. I've been here for around half, five and a half years now. I've uh, spent 23 years working in cybersecurity, and it's, and it's definitely a place where we've seen lots of change and evolution over the years, and, and not just within security, but also around the applications we use and how you protect your users and data on a daily basis. I'm also joined uh, by Richard Davis, um, who's the cybersecurity strategist for Proofpoint, who, like myself, is a, a seasoned cybersecurity professional with over 20 years' experience. Uh, the aim of today's session really is to discuss how Insider uh, risk affects all organizations and, and where and how data plays a large part in this. So we're, we're going to make this quite a fluid session. Um, we're happy to take you know, questions uh, throughout the session. So feel free to post them in the chat and we'll, we'll answer them uh, when we can. So talking about data, um, first and foremost, you know, everything we do rolls around data and, and you know, and it's, and it's, it's, it's everywhere today. There's been a huge explosion of data, you know, especially over the past uh, few years. So, it, and it's one of our most important assets uh, after people that is. Um, as the amount of data continues to accelerate through organizations, you know, like yourselves, uh, so does the importance of protecting it. And if we look at the shift in, in how people are working today, you know, especially since the uh, the pandemic and, and through business transformation, essentially organisations want their uh, employees to work smarter, you know, more effectively with efficiency and agility. So it's becoming even harder to stay protected from a data breach or security incident than ever before. We even saw this year the single biggest ransomware attack on record by the group Reveal, which affected thousands of organisations over a few weeks. Uh, it's pretty horrific, really. So this is why, you know, it's really important to have a, you know, a comprehensive plan uh, that uses the right approach when looking to protect uh, your data. Which is why, uh, as you see on your screens, we talk about, you know, data centric security. Um, for those of you that uh, follow NIST or understand the NIST cybersecurity framework, you know, this approach, uh, you know, discusses five areas. So, you know, identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Uh, the data centric uh, security approach uh, follows the same principles. So, you know, understanding, you know, where your data is, you know, what it is, you know, especially around the structured data. Um, so you can decide on, you know, who should have access to it and who shouldn't. So essentially protecting that data, um, you know, implementing those access controls, you know, around solutions, you know, such as, you know, next gen AV and endpoint protection platforms, you know, securing our gateways. Uh, and with with deal across DLP, sorry, across all of this, just to help safeguard safeguard the data, and, and then the monitoring, so that that kind of uh, proactive side of things. So understanding, you know, who is accessing the data, you know, when are they accessing it, uh, and monitoring for exfiltration. So who's copying or moving data around the network, or even outside of the environment, so via you know unapproved or unsanctioned uh, SaaS apps. And then last but not least. You know, back up and archive in a restore. Um, very crucial um, in any kind of organization. Uh, you need to ensure you've got the right solutions in place around that and processes uh, to make sure that, you know, in the event of a breach or a security incident, you can restore that data in a secure and efficient way. And on that note, I'd just like to introduce Richard Davis, uh, as mentioned earlier from Proofpoint. He's the cybersecurity strategist. He's going to talk to you around data loss and the risk of insider threats. So over to you, Richard. Yeah, thank you, Richard. Uh, great to be uh, joining you once again. Uh, before I get going, I really just want to extend my thanks to Richard and the CDW team for inviting both myself uh, and Proofpoint uh, to co-present today. Um, and I'm going to start actually just with the elephant in the room. And I think, you know, the elephant in the room really is that we've been here before. We've tried to address data loss with with DLP, and I think everybody's probably got their own DLP horror story here. And what we're going to try to do in the next half an hour or so is to look at some of the reasons why that's historically failed uh, and why some of the new approaches that you can take, especially when you're thinking about mitigating insider risk, can actually help change the game. Now, if, uh, 
you know, a horror story. I think actually it's got a bad reputation for a good reason, unfortunately. And why is that? Well, if we think about it from a definition point of view, actually DLP is a bit of a misnamed category in a way. It was actually originally defined by Ghana as content monitoring and filtering and data loss prevention and has since kind of been shortened to data loss prevention. But, you know, if we think about it in terms of those three words, actually, we can very simply why approach as previously. You know, from a data point of view, we've not always covered all data types. Historically, legacy DLP has focused on unstructured data. But what about all those databases that we've got? What about all of the web apps that we're working with day in, day out now, such as Salesforce and, and ServiceNow? If we think about it from a loss point of view, actually, it doesn't account for all loss scenarios because actually not all loss and not all insider threats are actually malicious. What do we do about uncovering threats like compromised accounts where the threat actor has simply access to pretend to be that insider? How do we deal with the education piece here as well? And then finally, what about the prevention piece? I've talked to so many customers over the years around prevention and they've all had the same problems. It's great to get an understanding, but we've never really got to the point of moving on to be able to take action and actually stop this data loss from occurring. And unfortunately, I think if we think about the tools, it's very easy for somebody who's motivated to circumvent this, even if it's a case of simply getting your phone out and taking a picture of the screen. About this in the right way, I think this in the wrong way. And I think historically we've so focused on that individual data movement and trying to stop the individual data movement that actually one of the big fundamentals that we haven't thought about is the bigger picture. It is looking at the overall landscape within an organization and actually what people are doing day in, day out. So if we actually think about the challenges that we're facing, especially when you're thinking about insider threats, both malicious and trying to achieve really changed. First and foremost, we've still got to meet the same regulatory compliance de uh, demands that we've got before. We've got to prove to auditors that we have the controls in place to reduce that risk. They're looking to see, have you put mitigating controls in? From an intellectual property point of view, I talked to so, so many companies day in, day out, who have got core intellectual property that they need to protect. And actually, over the last 18 months to two years, that's become more and more of a problem because historically, as to sensitive data, have typically been protected within the perimeter. And as people have shifted to working from anywhere, that's become a bigger and bigger problem for organizations who need to stay productive. But from a challenge point of view, we've got two key areas, I think, that come up time and time again. Firstly, I just don't have the visibility into the data movement. I don't actually know where my data lives and I don't know how that data is actually being exchanged in a good way, you know, in a legitimate way with, say, uh, business partners and supply chain. Delicious action. And of course, one that I think will resonate with everybody, which is this issue of false positives. I've been so overwhelmed with alerts and not being able to prioritize that actually I can't assess my risk properly. And I can't move on from that base program. So this probably sounds pretty familiar for a lot of you out there, um, but I want to just hand back to, to Richard uh, for a sec as well and share CEW's kind of perspective on this. Is this in line with what you talk to customers about day in day out, Richard? Yeah, it, it, it is. Uh, I mean, we, we talked to organizing around a lot of challenges, uh, for sure. Um, you know, if I, if I take the, you know, the 50,000, you know, foot view, you know, from a business perspective, uh, you know, they want the users to be able to work more, you know, efficiently, you know, smarter, uh, be more productive, you know, drive costs down, especially around capital expenditure. So driving cost efficiencies through uh, predictable billing, which is essentially subscription based 
uh, building in line with how you know the, the, the business grows. Um, obviously, you mentioned there things like you know compliance and IP, that the visibility, the false positives, all, all of those are you know are all from a security point of view. You know, and from that perspective, um, you know most of our conversations are generally around uh, how how organisations want to decrease their risk and obviously improve uh, the maturity. So. Um, you know, from a technology point of view, if we look at the three most, you know, common conversations that we're having, then, you know, ransomware protection is up there for sure. Um, cloud security as well. Um, so moving to Azure or AWS, um, and obviously with the hybrid model, um, and then obviously security within SaaS apps. So that whole cloud piece is definitely expanded for us. And, and then the remote working, you know, at scale um, over the past two years, obviously we've seen a lot of that. Um, so everything from protecting, you know, user identities, uh, endpoint devices, um, and then obviously the, you know, how access is granted to uh, those applications. And of course, you know, what I spoke about earlier about protecting data. Uh, I also find that in pretty much every conversation, you know, zero trust uh, would also come up a lot as well. Yeah, great. And, and going back to, you know, my comments a slide or so ago on uh, DLP. Traditionally, with DLP, have you got on on that from your perspective? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, you, you mentioned earlier about the horror stories. I think there's a lot of organisations uh, I know that I've spoken to that do have have their horror stories. Uh, of course, some just you know just don't want to admit it, and that's that's fine. Even though uh, obviously they, they they should be with the ICO and GDPR. Um, you know, for me, the key thing uh, again around DLP is, is around approach, you know, which I mentioned earlier. That, that whole visibility of what you've got, you know, where is it? You know, how do you classify that? The access to it. Um, I, I think all all those kind of things are paramount in, in terms of how you should uh, approach and implement a, a DLP solution. Um, you also have to think about how you know you you look into share data, you know, um, outside of the organisation as well. Um, you know, and that's getting hard to patrol with uh, with the SaaS apps that I just mentioned. Um, you know, a, another interesting note, you know, that I find um, isn't just through conversations, but but also through conducting you know assessments with the customers. So uh, around subsections of data. So we also find that you know not only you know trying to look for who's got access to files and who shouldn't, but we also find in that there's a lot of hidden threats inside of those files as well, just waiting to explode. Um, so ransomware, for instance, so that a lot of them, some of them can be time-based, um, which highlights that it's not just a DLP technology we should be thinking about, but also you know more of an integrated solution uh, for protecting that data across you know multiple different types of solutions. Yeah, thanks for that, Richard. And you know, going from my own personal experience, having you know, spoken with many many customers, I think actually the last item here is probably the one that that resonates most with people. Yeah, hundred percent. Just exactly. Just one, you know, one story of a customer that I, I spoke with recently. Just the thing to highlight this was that, you know, they got to the point where they had twelve full time people simply looking through alerts and trying to prioritize alerts, and never really got to the bottom of it because, even with that number of people, they never found a good way of being able to, um, programmatically. Uh, very quickly outline whether or not it was a valid hit and then the level of priority you know what was the potential impact, uh, on this and it just became uh, a, a project that stalled simply because of the man hours that they needed to put into it versus what they perceived was the actual end reduction in risk and i think this is the ultimately the problem that we face or we faced with this approach of focusing on data and focusing on uh, the data and that data movement and really just looking at, you know, in effect, we're, we're pretty good capability for that data. Um, but one that, if you look at the data alone, was never going to give you the priority uh, that you need to make these programs work. I've also talked to organizations who have continued with this and, you know, just with the data, uh, approach have eventually managed to tune their rules after you know many months in some cases a couple of years to the point where actually they've got their rule set now that's so complex that yes it's doing its job but is now just hard to manage the rule set because it's got to the point where it's evolved so much um, that it's having a, a a management nightmare on the rule side 
even though they've now solved some of the false positive challenges. So I think that now's a good time, uh, Richard, probably to pull up uh, our first of uh, two polls because I want to get an idea really from the audience as to as to you know where they are on their journey. So if we think about this from an insider risk point of view, I'm just interested um, to to understand whether people uh, have got this kind of as an active project. So if you've got uh, kind of this insider risk as an active Or you got something in place. If you don't have anything in place, no. And if you're just investigating, if you join this perhaps because you're concerned, you just want to find out more around the problem of insider risk and, and taking a new approach, uh, then select don't know. So I'm just going to give people a little bit of time uh, just to respond to this and hopefully it gives us an idea as to the direction to take uh, the rest of today's session. So how are we doing with uh, responses? Yeah, we've got seven finished so far. So I think one or two more answers and then we can get going. Okay, let's have a look at the results and see, uh, see what the distribution is. Or not? <laughs> is this, is, is, is this where the poll doesn't work? <laughs> no, 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 it worked. I just need to figure out what to do here. All right, so we've got um, about fifty percent that said yes. Um, we've got eight percent that said no, and thirty-three percent that said don't know. Okay, so that's what that's what I would I would typically expect expect, especially if you're you know you've been interested enough to actually. Uh, to join this session. Uh, I think you know, those that are in the don't know camp, uh, hopefully we provide a little bit of insight and help you drive your, you know, the direction you might want to take. Uh, for those that said yes, hopefully the next uh, 20 minutes or so just might give you food for thought as to how you can maybe adapt uh, your current strategy or direction uh, if, uh, if you've not fully completed and mulled out, uh, you know, a solution or or completed this project. So. I'm going to move on. We've talked a little bit about what is the same. We've talked about the historic challenges and really the fact that actually what we're trying to achieve is the same. But of course, one major thing has changed and what's changed is how we work. And this isn't really to do with the pandemic. This happened a long time ago when we started our digital transformations and we started to change. I think actually it's really just accelerated this. Uh, you know, all of the customers that I talked to said, well, we're already on this journey. We just had to accelerate the rollout of of how we used services and and how we protected our, our people as they start to work from different locations. Um, you know, Richard, what's your point of view on this? I know, um, obviously, this is something you talk to customers day in, day out. Um, if we think about it from a, you know, from a point of view of, as to you know, the services we're using, what I see is people using services across the board from you know SaaS applications to uh, to uh, infrastructure service platforms such as Azure and AWS, and of course, kind of traditional um, localized systems. What are you typically seeing your customers um, focusing on right now? Yeah, I'd, I'd say look, very similar conversations. You know, there's no doubt um, a lot of our conversations with customers are around. Uh, how they're they're working. We know that you know the return to the office has you know started for some, um, but definitely it, it does seem to be a case of the user and the device could be anywhere. They, and in fact, it might not even be a corporate device, um, and they need to access you know applications and the environment in a secure way. Um, and you know, there's other conversations that go with that about how organisations are looking at how they use you know uh, I'll call it SASE, which is obviously the Gartner term, but you know, how they actually move you know that how they close offices how they how they you know make their offices uh, much more efficient as well so a lot of call it i call it secure access type conversations uh, and of course those conversations include everything from protecting the user the device um and also you know how, how they authenticate to access applications and and across all of that you've you've obviously got all those 
security concerns with um you know with malware etc and, and compromised credentials so that, that, that seems to be quite a lot of the conversations that we're having in in different guises to be honest yeah yeah and that that's exactly the same as the conversations that that i'm having with our with our customers on the information protection side you know, obviously i'm sure a lot of people on this call know proof point as a you know leading provider of threat uh, protection technologies specifically and especially across email uh, but actually a large part of our business focuses on you know what you what you just highlighted which is the um the sassy uh, or secure access service edge side of the uh of the of the point and the the new um uh, security services edge aspect of that so how do you wrap security around around that move and i think what this has kind of got us to the point where if we think about it from a a, a securing information point of view actually we've got to put the person at the center because it's the person that's actually now connecting and exchanging data with all of these sources and i think these are the four main things that that people need to consider we've got the legacy connection back into the organization into the data center to everything that you're still running locally and that's traditionally what we focused on but we've got now connections into azure and aws based services that maybe you, you know you're running yourself some organizations are, are taking people back in uh, to uh, via vpn and and then are perhaps thinking about it from monitoring the network connection and still kind of focusing on the network layer but people less and less are driving people into things like SaaS tools and platforms via the VPN just because of the um, the inefficiencies in doing so, as well as considering things like how do you deal with connections to what I've la labelled here as remote tools, the tools that you as an organisation can't manage. You're probably communicating with business partners, with supply chain. We're actually probably using their services. So how do you make sure you secure a connection to a supply chain partner's box instance where you have to use that to exchange data with that organization, but you need to be able to monitor uh, that access and potentially take action to make sure that the wrong data doesn't get exchanged with those services. And that, you know, this is ultimately what it comes down to. It's it's moving from securing the perimeter to thinking about how you secure people and how you monitor what people are doing. And you know, we've been talking about this for 10 years or so. I'm not gonna labor the point on this slide, um, but you know, I think each of these five areas have really driven uh, this change, really driven this change. And we, you know, we talked in a little bit about some of these areas. And I think to take an approach here that's going to work in terms of monitoring for insider threats, we've got to look at a higher level around how does the, you, your organization operate today? How far, you, far are you into this journey and where does your critical information and your critical data reside? Who's it being exchanged with and where does your highest level of risk actually lie to, at the very beginning of projects? I think I've talked to so many customers who have decided to deploy DLP and they've deployed the tools in and they've you know, put an endpoint agent in, they've got network detection, and then they're thinking, right, well, what data do we now need to protect? And in fact, they've approached it in the wrong way because I think first you need a really fundamental understanding of your data, where it lives and how it's being exchanged to know what are the right tools and the right approach to take. And you know, this whole space is not an easy one to solve. We know based on various different data sources, this one I'm actually going to look at the Verizon data breach report for this statistic, 30% of breaches actually involve an internal threat actor. That's a big enough percentage to be really concerned about. But what's the breakdown of that 30%? Because again, this is going to be different for every organization and this is also going to affect how you drive your approach. And this is something I recommend that every organization uh, thinks about as part of any sort of planning or early project phase, which is, are you more concerned about careless? So somebody who's trying to do their job, but actually just makes a mistake. Malicious data movements where you've actually got somebody intentionally trying to leak data. What I think actually people think about when they think about an insider threat, um, but in fact, it actually crosses all of these. And then also, What's your concern around having uh, an account that's compromised, a threat actor simply accessing that account and using that account 
to exfiltrate data. Now, the interesting thing is that actually nearly two thirds of all incidents are this careless category of people just trying to do their job and making mistakes. Malicious is second and then compromised is a smaller proportion. However, actually, it's the inverse of that when you think about the cost to an organization. A compromised account is going to actually have a much higher cost than malicious, which again has a higher cost than that careless incident. If if we just look at all of the incidents across the board, uh, and I think there's two other key stats that, that really drive home why we should focus on this. You know, the first is the actual average annual cost, and of course, this is across both big and small organisations. So this, you know, this is a big figure of 11 million, and I don't think that really tells the full story, but it does give us an idea as to the scope of the problem. But I think the more interesting one here is the average time to resolve an insider incident: 77 days to fully resolve and close out an incident. We need to get that to hours, not days, if it's actually going to have an impact in reducing our business risk. And if we think about how we've tried to achieve this before, I've talked in, in depth already in today's session around this, this area of DLP. And I think a lot of organizations have looked at uh, UEBA, so User Entity Behavior Analytics, to try to solve this problem. And this is something that actually, again, takes a lot of man hours to manage and, and filter. And for some companies, they've put a lot of effort into this, and this has helped them as part of their triage of DLP instance. They've taken a DLP instant, they've looked at the user, maybe they've then looked at UBA data to try to do some manual correlation, and they've succeeded to some extent. But very few organizations I've talked to have really you know, made that work in this type of context as a standalone product. Things like uh, uh, solutions and patients. Again, neither of these two are really designed for this specific use case uh, and are both kind of limited in what their scope is today. So I want to bring this kind of closer to home. Uh, and I, I want to use Morrison's as an example of, of what we're facing here. Uh, Morrison's is actually a, a very interesting case. I don't have to go into details as to who they are. I'm sure everyone on this call is very familiar with them. But this is a very interesting uh, case study. You know, they've got over 100,000 employees. Uh, and they serve over 10 million customers. We have a very, very interesting internal incident. One of their internal auditors, so somebody who's actually trusted with safeguarding data, actually got slaps on the wrist uh, on the wrist for a, a, a small misconduct incident. He didn't lose his job, was just given a verbal warning. But he held on to that for months and months, waiting for the right moment because he had a grievance around that. And when he was transmitting full global payroll data of all their employees to an external auditor, he actually made a copy at the same time for his personal. Not only did he actually website, but he actually also sent it to several news outlets. Um, and you know that data became very public and was you know, quite an quite an issue for Morrison's in terms of their brand perception. You know, the actual root cost of the business was around two million, but that doesn't include the brand damage. How they weren't even able to put a figure on that brand damage. Now, actually, in, in this case, uh, it went through the course, and Morrison's weren't actually found. It was actually Dempsey, but that doesn't stop the effect on the business. Well. How can an inside a risk platform actually help and and solve this particular issue where actually that user is allowed to send that data out, is allowed to exchange that data with third party? How do you stop that type of incident? So from an approach point of view, I'm going back to what I said before is getting a fundamental understanding of who's what kind of cases are negligent, what kind of cases are compromised, and what kind of cases are malicious is really key to trying to solve this problem. Now, data only moves from where it should be to where it shouldn't be because a person does something. And this is why actually observing behavior of people is part of the key to actually solving this issue. So I'm gonna pause here, because I think actually it'd be really useful to, to kind of jump into a, another polling, just get a sense of where people think they're there. So what kind of insider risk are you most concerned about? So, uh, Connor, if you bring it, oh, 
you beat me to it, the poll's already live. So is it an accidental leak of a careless user? Is it misuse by a mis uh, malicious user or, or fraudulent use by a malicious user or perhaps data theft? Or is it espionage or a threat trying to have a compromised account to exfiltrate data? Maybe nation state that's trying to steal your intellectual property. So we'll just let that run for a, a few minutes. Um, while I'm doing that, um, Richard, any more thoughts on what I've what I've just covered in terms of kind of those traditional approaches? I know that you've worked with you know various different uh, customers. You've you've looked at some of these solutions. Is what I've talked about in terms of the approach resonating with with you? Uh, yeah, no, hundred percent. I mean, and you know, I think most people find I, I talk about approach a lot. I think that's one of the most important things with any. Uh, with any security project, really. Um, but also, it was quite interesting, some of the things you, you, you said earlier as well around uh, the actual uh, breaches itself and the threat actors. I mean, uh, the 77 days, for instance, you know, average time to resolve uh, a resolve or incident, that's, you know, obviously, that's a lot of time we want to get down to hours. But, you know, um, it's even longer to actually detect the incident um, for a lot of organisations. So actually, it, it might take 77 days to resolve, but it might take something like, up to 200 days to actually mm -hmm. see that you've actually got an incident in the first place. So, you know, some really good information and stats there um, from, from my point of view. Um, so, yeah. Cool, great. How's the uh, poll doing? I mean, yeah, I was about to say, we can probably close it out and let's have a look at the results. Connette, if you could give us a breakdown as to, as to uh, how people voted. Okay, so we've got an even split between mm. accidental leak, data theft, and espionage, but no answers on misuse or fraud. That's that's quite an interesting uh, stat. Okay. I mean, I think from you know just actually hearing that from my point of view, um, I think sometimes the misuse and the fraud are very hard to actually um, ascertain whether whether it's happened that way. But um, yeah, that's, that's quite an interesting split, I'd say. Yeah. Right. Well, with that in mind, how do we how do we go about solving this? And I want to close out today's session just with, um, you know, from Proofpoint's point of view, why we believe that you really must get an understanding of your people risk and you of what your people are doing as part of this answer. And. How should you go about doing that? Well, I think we really need to think about these three key areas. Firstly, we must really think about the data context. How are your people interacting with data? How are they manipulating it? What do they traditionally do in terms of moving and transferring sensitive files? More so from a user context, how resources parties do they typically interact with day in day out and what's their typical behavior profile and then we've got this third area which is the threat context what are the what is the threat profile of each individual user how do you even go about trying to ascertain and understand that are they an employee or a contractor maybe that actually changes your perceived level of risk do you know what they are under from account compromise or credential phishing uh, attempts? If they are, that's great. That's going to greatly increase the chances that that could be a compromised account attack down the line. But also, are the users on a watch list? Now, some of you may already be using this concept of putting people on a watch list when you know maybe they're under suspicion of. Um, uh, an internal HR issue. Maybe they're on a watch list because they are a likely lever. Just because they have access to information. But more so, how do you use the lists and the access that you've got to actually not only create the right policies for any program, but the right response? How do you use this data to help to decide whether or not it's a false positive and automate the initial first stage triage. But secondly, the prioritization. This data here is really going to help an organization be able to build automated prioritization. 
really goes to solving the traditional challenges. So how do you take this on? How do you practically use this approach? Well, this is about actually building these intelligent watch lists, building these intelligent groups, some of which can be tied back into your directory. Some of them can be tied into uh, information coming from the rest of your security platform. That's where uh, you know CDW um, have this great insight into how you're using your tools and can actually work to integrate the different tools into this type of view. There's some really useful that is coming from EDR solutions, really useful information around privileged access that you probably got from uh, from some of your identity systems and your identity solutions that can really help here, as well as things like Proofpoint's own very attacked people profiling within our threat platform. Understand who's likely to be attacked and whether or not they're vulnerable. All of this will help you solve that malicious uh, data loss aspect through a, a compromised account. But going into a little bit more detail on this, this visibility is part of it is content inspection. There is still a place to look at content and decide, right, has this been marked with um, uh, with um, Microsoft labels, MIP or whatever they've renamed it now, they seem to rename it every few years, uh, the Microsoft uh, uh, labeling of, of documents. Should we actually look and inspect the content to look for data within the file? That is still valid and can help us, but that's not or should not be the focus. We should be actually looking and we are interacting with, and this has to be across everything, cloud platforms, SaaS tools, uh, in, 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 in all of the collaboration tools and platforms that we use day in, day out. But more so, this aspect of getting an idea of data interaction is so key. What are your users typically doing? Are they moving? Are they emailing files out? Are they renaming documents? Are they trying to upload data to cloud repositories that maybe you own in a, a, a managed service or maybe a repository by a third party because that's part of your business practice? And then finally, this aspect of whether or not there is a known threat. And you know, again, there's a few examples on here. You know, flagging information from the dark web as to who could or couldn't be attacked, et cetera whether or not they're, uh, they're subject to potential you know, endpoint malware attacks, tying it into your EDA. And big account aspect. And only when you can pull all three of these aspects in, do you actually get to a point where you've got a unified set of data that uses not just the content of the email to really solve this issue. So from a proof point point of view, We've got a comprehensive Proofpoint uh, platform, our information and cloud security platform, that includes what we call sensors. So our approach is to provide a unified policy, a you investigate all of the sensors you've put in place. Because actually for some people, the primary thing that they need to protect first may be endpoint, because actually they've got a you know, in a state of fully managed endpoints, nobody has access to data other than a managed endpoint, and it's a great place to put that first sensor to start getting visibility. For other organizations, it might be, we're just really concerned about oversharing in OneDrive and SharePoint. And the first place to start is to actually connect an API into Office to start visibility. And then you build out your sensors after that, and each of these sensor areas will then allow you to actually start enforcing and taking action on this data. So where do you start? Well, from our point of view, so many customers start with this aspect of endpoint because that lightweight endpoint agent that we can deploy as one of these points to start monitoring data. It will deal with connection to USB. It will deal with the issues around the connectivity to cloud services by VPN back to your own uh, systems. It's also going to give you an understanding of that risky behavior and again give you the ability to start hunting for those new risks by using 
the instant manager capabilities that we've got. It's also going to allow you to start enforcing very and allow you to build it into your overall instant workflows. Now, the key thing from our point of view is that there are two key components to our insider threat management capability. There's a lightweight endpoint DLB component, which is going to uh, monitor the endpoint to a degree and look for uh, look for potential suspicious behavior as well as content based movements. And then a much fuller insider threat management. Where the same agent behavior and for the fuller insider threat management capability, that's where we're able to turn on all of the extended and advanced logging capabilities to actually start getting a full understanding of the behavior going on. So for your people that are on watch lists, for those that have access to that really sensitive data, organizations that are deploying this approach of deploying the full uh, capabilities to the insider threat management agent and capturing all of that really kind of user-based data, even down application how they're moving data around, whether they're renaming files, uh, whether they're going in and actually connecting to and running searches around the ways to delete your browser cache, for instance, to try to, you know, um, uh, hide some of their um, hide some of their steps, even including down to the point of actually being able to take screenshots to give you that that view of the uh, of the um, of the endpoint and what is going on. So, you know, to to close off, I think. Organizations that are moving, they're moving from focusing purely on detecting that content within the data source to actually moving to this people centric approach that correlates not only what's in the data, but the threat aspect, and more importantly, bringing in user behavior, bringing in and automating a lot of what UEBA, dedicated UEBA solutions are doing but integrating this deeply into this approach as one of three key data sources. Not only that, but unifying sensors and build out your SASE journey over time. And then finally, a platform, sorry, a platform that is cloud native and scalable, that is easy to deploy and easy to manage and doesn't require many local capabilities. So I think I've kind of covered enough. Um, I'm going to just uh, ask for uh, Richard if he's got any um, kind of closing thoughts on this um, before we break for any questions. So please do use the Q. Um, and uh, also feel feel free to come off mute if you need to. So Richard, any closing thoughts there? I can't hear you, Richard. I don't know if you're muted. Apologies, everyone. I was just talking about the gremlins in WebEx today, as, uh, as I was saying, some of the sound may have not come through. So apologies, everyone uh, who's been on the uh, the, the session today. Uh, yeah, look, I mean, I think we, we've spoken a lot about um, approach for sure. You know, um, you know, I think uh, that that approach uh, to security and to any kind of DLP, you know, project or, or, or security around data is is one of the most you know, important things to me. And I think, you know, you've actually, you've covered, you've talked about, and I've talked about it. So I know, you know, we're, we're definitely in sync there. Um, you know, data is definitely one of our most important assets. And, uh, you know, we need to make sure we take that, uh, that right approach to, um, to protect the data. Um, look, we, we know that threats aren't going away. Um, you know, in, in fact, you know, if we look uh, at last year, there was something like a 715% rise in, in, in ransomware. Um, it's huge, you know, huge growth. It's, you know, on a daily basis, we're seeing new threats. Um, you know, it's a money market. It's a money making market, you know, for, for attackers and, and, and hacktivists. So, you know, it's a business for them. Uh, and in some ways that you can make more money out of stealing data and uh, than you can out of uh, selling the solutions to protect you. So there's some uh, room for thought there for sure. Um, you know, DLP for me, uh, as you've spoken about, you know, is, is really key. It's crucial. Um, but again, going back to your your slide around approach, you know, ha having that visibility first, 
um, it, it's, is, is definitely the best way to, to approach this and, and understanding, you know, what, what, what is actually, you know, inside those types of files. Um, and then, you know, again, inside a risk, uh, we mentioned endpoint visibility. I think it's, it's key that I think organizations and yourselves, you know, uh, understand that we, we need to put agents on machines you know, we need to actually understand uh, the, the behavioral analysis of what's going on. So whether it's about detecting uh, a, a malware attack or whether it's detecting uh, a data breach, um, we need agents to, to provide that visibility and that monitoring that reporting. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'd say that they're probably my, my final thoughts uh, around around uh, the session today. Yeah, and actually you make a good point there. You bring up the, the, the agent aspect. And one of, the, I think, the key things that a lot of organizations also struggled with was that heavyweight endpoint agent before. It would integrate at the kernel level, and it would actually cause you know, a lot of issues with the ongoing management of the machine, and certainly the IT teams there to support it. With plans. Now, one of the things that's been key to Proofpoint as we've developed out this solution, and you know, we've acquired components to acquisition, is to make sure that we have a lightweight capability. So it's not running at the kernel level, it's not deeply integrating, but it's running and capturing the right amount of data without impacting on the performance of, of that machine. Um, obviously, if you start turning on some of the enforcement capabilities, then it's going to operate in a different way. Um, but from a data capture point of view, um, then you know it's not going to have a, a big impact on, on that. Uh, so I've just uh, pulled up on the screen, hopefully uh, giving you a chance to uh, to get your, your phones out and uh, and scan that QR code. Um, a lot of what I've talked about today in terms of the concept of, of the approach is in our Redefining DLP um, white paper or ebook. So if you want to know a little bit more, if you want to just uh, review some of the concepts that we've talked about in today's session, then please do go and grab that document. Um, Richard, doesn't look like we've had any any questions uh, uh, that have come in via the, the Q&A. So, you know, from a Thoughts shared some of those. You know, from my point, I think the the key takeaways that I would want to get across to people are really firstly, you know, before you embark on any project around um, deploying any solutions, understand what is going on, understand where your data <coughs> lives and where your sensitive IP is, understand what your business needs to protect. Engage those key stakeholders outside of security to understand what are the crown jewels for the organization? Where is that um, potential risk and data lying? Use a framework document as to what you're trying to achieve before you deploy technology. Secondly, there are plenty of tools out there, including uh, Proofpoint's own, that will give you that visibility without taking any action to validate what you've outlined in your document. And that's the second thing, validate the theory behind the project that you're putting together. And then thirdly, when you're deploying a product, whether it be proof points or any others, think about what is capturing in your triage and your investigation. Is the tool gonna to give you everything you need in a nice view, correlating everything for you? Or are there a lot of manual steps involved that are going to greatly increase the timeline and the scope that users have to have to deal with. So, Richard, I don't know if you've got any uh, closing thoughts or whether uh, you're just happy to close out the session. Yeah, no, I think, um, look, from my point of view, you know, just want to thank you all for um, you know, attending uh, today's session. Uh, I think it's been really informative and, and, and thank you, Richard, as well, for your expert insights, you know. Uh, I think they've been appreciated as, as, as well. Um, I think from a CDW perspective, you know, uh, if you like to know anything you know, more around what we've discussed today or anything else around security, then, you know, do, do feel free to contact myself or your account manager, or you can email the security info inbox. Uh, we will actually follow up with with all of you anyway, just to just to gauge your thoughts and to see where we can help you, especially around DLP and, and insider threats. So look, just a big thank you for myself for your time. And I hope you enjoyed the rest of your day and week. Yeah, no problem. And same for me. Thank you very much. And thanks once again for CDW for inviting Proofpoint and myself to join today. Uh, great to present you with you uh, once again, Richard. Look forward to doing it again soon. Yeah, hopefully next time we'll do something in person. Yeah, yeah. It'd be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> thanks, everybody.
Great. Thank you all.